Hello everyone, welcome to another tutorial side quest thing. Today we are taking a look at the Godot documentation. And this might sound familiar, but today we're not looking at this part of the documentation as we were before. So something like what's a node, what's a button. Instead, I want to take a step back and look at this part of the documentation. Uh, what is a property? What is a method? How do I read the documentation for myself? And so I want to quickly show an example of how this might be useful. Uh, this is something I ran into recently, but I had a question. I have an array here and I would like to get a random element out of that array. Now, I feel like this is something that should exist, but I'm not sure what that method would be called. So I'm going to come down and I'm going to hold control and click on the array here, and it'll take me to the documentation right here inside the engine. I know what I'm looking for would be a method if it exists. Uh, so I'm just going to scroll through these and see if there's something that includes the word random might indicate what I'm looking for. We'll see here there is a function called pick random. That sounds like it might be what I want. So I'm going to click on it and it'll give me a full description and we'll see that this returns a random value from the target array, which is exactly what I was looking for. So if I hold control, press W, it will close that documentation page. I am right here where I was previously. And then all I have to do is use this method that I found. This is how I answer about 80% of the questions I have as I'm working in Godot. Uh, every now and then I have to go open up, you know, an internet browser page and go Google something, but that is a little bit more rare. Most of the time I'm able to find the information I need right here in the documentation. That's the goal for today's video. I want you to understand how the documentation works so you can go in and you can find these answers for yourself and you don't have to rely on the internet uh, to answer these basic questions. This here is a class that I made for my most recent video, uh, Asteroid Survivors, and I'm going to be using this as a foundation. So we're going to be documenting this class in detail today. And as I'm documenting this, I'm going to be doing side by side comparisons between how this code looks and how the documentation looks. And so the hope is by the end of this, you can look at the documentation for a class where we don't have the code and hopefully visualize what that code might have looked like. If I run this, you'll see how this all works. So I have a radar component, uh, that's what this area is, and when objects enter the radar, they get added to a track list. Now you can see here, I have a turret attached to this, and it is targeting the nearest asteroid. Now this other weapon, uh, this missile battery, is targeting random asteroids. So you can see these targets are being placed kind of randomly on anything within this radar range. And so both of these are utilizing this radar and they're just asking for the nearest target or for a random target. So that's how this works. Uh, there's a little bit more to it, but we'll get into that as we go. Let's start at the top of the file then, work our way down. Every node starts with an icon. So I'm going to add one of these. This is an annotation, by the way. If you hold control, click on it, you can get more information on how to do this. Also, if you download the official source code, you can grab all of these icons. Uh, they are a couple places inside. Uh, editor icons is one of them. Uh, there's a couple others. But it just search for SVG and you can find them all. So if you want to take a look at how the official icons are created, you can open these up in Inkscape. But I created an icon and I actually exported this as a PNG, which you shouldn't do. You'll see that this doesn't look quite as good because of that. But now if I add one of these to a scene, it's not actually going to change the icon right away. You do need to reload the project. Once I do that, I'll get the new icon. So if I do a radar, we'll see this has my little icon image I added. And if I create one of these, this shows up here. If I come over here to this little DOC, it will open up the documentation. I feel like this is a bug, but it always opens the base class, even if I have a script that is in extending that base class. But you'll see class area 2D is actually inherited by radar. So this was dynamically updated. This documentation modified itself to include my new class. If I click that, we'll see I have some documentation already. Now, there are no descriptions for anything, but it's cool that the documentation is here. The next thing I want to look at is this line below the icon class name radar extends area 2d the extending area 2d part is this inheritance and you'll see this goes all the way down so this is an area 2d but then it inherits collision object node canvas item node object and if i were to add one of these to the scene again you'll see that this inheritance tree comes all the way down so this up here and this down here are the same thing 
This gives us some practical benefits. If, for example, I wanted to get the position, I can do that. And if I hold control, click on this, it will take me to the node 2D where position is defined. So if you're ever wondering why a property isn't appearing somewhere, it may be a part of a base class, not this class itself. So the area 2D doesn't have a position, the node 2D does, uh, but by extension, the area 2D does. Now it's not very helpful to have a class with no description, so I'm gonna add one here. If I put a comment in and I say, this is a description, save this, open up, and it will still say there's no description. That's because a single hash symbol is a comment, but a double hash symbol is a documentation comment. Now it says this is a description. And if I go to add one of these to the scene again, you'll actually see this description shows up down here at the bottom. Radar, this is a description. So for all of these objects, we'll see a quick description of how they work. And so that is a nice quick way to understand what a node is, for example. But if you want a little bit more information, you click into the documentation and we'll see this basic description here, but then a much longer description down here. So I'm gonna give my class a long description as well. I'll do that by adding an empty documentation string. And then after that will be the long description. And this is a convention thing, automatically breaks it up. So now we have a short description and a long description. Now I'll just fill this out with a proper description. I may have went a little overboard on that one, but I wanted this to look more like an official node. So we have a full description, which is just what I demonstrated earlier. You'll notice I have a couple annotations here. You can put a couple specialized annotations within the comments of documentation. And this actually links to the style guide to tell us how to do that. So we'll see these annotations that are available. I just link those to make it easy for me, but typically you will see the online tutorial section under a lot of these nodes. And if you are confused as to how something works, uh, this documentation is very technical. It just gives you the details of what it is, not really how to use it. So if you wanna know how to use it, these tutorials are a good link to go to. And almost every node has a tutorial section. I'll go ahead and open a second window so we can start looking at this stuff side by side. The first two things here are going to be properties and methods and the properties are going to be storing a bit of data methods are going to be doing a bit of work and these are the primary building blocks i'd say every single node you're going to run into is going to have a lot of properties and a lot of methods and they may also have other things but these are going to be pretty constant everywhere you go for the properties, these are just storing a little bit of data. Uh, so this nearest target, for example, is holding onto a tracked body, which, by the way, if anything's underlined, you can click on it. So if I go here, it'll bring me to radar.trackbody, and this is a class I defined at the bottom of the file. We'll get into what that is in a little bit. Uh, but that is my few extra things that couldn't fit into the main class as far as different types of documentation bits. Uh, but so we have this track body type. By the way, if I were to remove that and regenerate the docs, you'll see that this defaults to a variant. Uh, that's what this VAR is. A variant is the most basic type, and you're not going to see a lot of variants in the documentation. That's because everything is statically typed like I have. You don't have a lot of just this is whatever you want it to be, unless it's something like a dictionary where then you actually are taking in a variant as an argument. So that's something you'll notice. The other thing is this has a default value. This is being set to null, meaning when you start up the radar for the first time, you're gonna get a null value. And you'll know if I ask what this is right off the bat, that's what I'm gonna get. Uh, the Area 2D has a lot of default values as well. Uh, basically everything does because Godot wants you to know what should I expect when I just start this class up for the first time. Scrolling down to the methods then, First off, I should address the number of properties and methods looks a lot different in this file compared to this file. I have five here and three here, and I have, what, seven methods, and I only have one showing up. That's because everything with an underscore is private by default. Any private property or method will not show up. Uh, the nice thing about Godot, it's not too rigid on this. I've worked in some programming languages before that will use a header file to define public things and then define all of the private stuff in a hidden private file. And that works great in theory until you realize you actually needed something that was private and then you have to go use like reflection and it becomes this whole mess. And so Godot just uses the honor system. They say, hey, uh, this is my laser turret, which is using a radar to get to the nearest target. And so if I want to go radar dot 
underscore on body entered. Should I be calling this? Probably not. It starts with an underscore, but I can. There's nothing preventing me from doing it. Uh, but because I really shouldn't be calling it, it's not going to show up in the documentation because the documentation only shows you the things that you actually want to deal with. If, for example, I really did want you to be aware that I am storing my targets in an array called track targets, I could change this to a documentation string. When I do that, this will actually show up. So now I have a underscore property here. That is how a private property or method can show up. But yeah, those are properties in general. They are storing value. Methods, on the other hand, are doing some work. Coming down to my only method that is explicitly defined, <laughs> here we are with has target. You see, this is actually doing something. So up here, we're just getting a value. Give me the nearest target, whatever that happens to be. Down here, I'm saying, hey, I, uh, for this one, it's returning true if the body is currently tracked by the radar. So it's going through and it's checking its array and it's receiving a body in as an argument. Uh, so this is the argument here within the parentheses. It's receiving that and it is doing some work on it. It's checking it and then it's returning a Boolean. So over here is the return type. And again, this is explicitly defined. So you got a bool here, just like the properties you'll see in the documentation. All of these are going to be explicit. If you're generating your own docs, you might see a lot more variants unless you are being very careful to statically type everything. But yeah, this function here, oh, actually it's called a method. Uh, yeah, so about that, FUNC stands for function. And I've been programming for years and it feels like every language defines this differently. Uh, and so it kind of can get confusing. There are functions, which are little bits of code that do something. For example, there is a print function. So this one does whatever. And if I hold control click in, we'll see this print function here is actually defined on the global scope. So this is not inside a class at all. Uh, this is just sitting out there free open in the world. If I try to call has target, that doesn't exist out in the global scope. This only is attached to a radar component. So that is a method. It is a function that is attached to something. There is a little bit of a middle ground. Here, if I were to change this to capital R radar, uh, it should throw an error because this is non-static function. Uh, so let's define a static function instead. Uh, I didn't actually fill it out, I just wanted to do, uh, but basically this one could create a radar component from a script. So we'll do the, maybe a load up a scene, initialize it, uh, set that range on it and do anything else we want. So we'll see this one has the keyword static, which makes it clear that this function can be called from a capital R radar. If I come back into my laser turret class, uh, I already showed that if I change this to capital R, it throws an error because you can't be calling this on the class itself. That is not true for the function we just defined. So we see create radar. Uh, by the way, this dot F, this implies that this is a function. Functions versus parameters will show up there in that little bit of a type hint too. So again, if we were to do radar dot nearest target, we'll see dot P, that's parameter, dot F, that is function. Let's go back up to these properties though, because I kind of glossed over how these ones do what they do. You'll notice these say property getter. If I come into here, it says get and then return something. So this one, target count, isn't actually a value. Uh, you know, I just said property store some value, but it's actually giving you the size of this private track targets array. Uh, and so that is a getter. Uh, you'll see this sometimes in the documentation. There are also setters, which will set things. And something to point out, actually, if I come into some of these, it won't explicitly say that they have getters and setters, but if you click into them, a lot of times it'll show you here in the documentation that they have those. Uh, I think these are because these were defined using an older style and the documentation hasn't changed. But as you see in my documentation, uh, it's a little bit more clear up front that this one has a getter. Now, something you probably shouldn't do, and I did anyways in this particular one, uh, you'll notice my random target actually returns a random target. Uh, it calls this pick random call, which means if you were to call this 10 times, you could get 10 different values. This is a little bit iffy. Uh, something that's definitely not allowed is I could do Q free, which means when you ask for a random target, the class destroys itself. 
This is known as a side effect, and you should not see this in anything that is officially documented in Godot. Uh, this is not a good design practice to have these side effects of it doing work when you're just asking for a value, uh, but there are some things that will happen within these setters and getters, oftentimes things like translation. If I were to go into the Node2D, for example, there are a lot of things like this position versus global position where data is redundant, and so I don't actually know which one it's storing under the hood, and it doesn't really matter, but you'll see these all use getters and setters. And so you could call this function directly, but you can just call the property and it'll call the function under the hood. And so that is the power of these things. Oftentimes you can repeat information and you don't really have to worry about what it's doing as it's repeating that information. Uh, if it has a global position, but it's storing the value as a local position and just doing math, that's fine. The next couple of categories we're going to look at are signals and constants. Uh, constants are pretty simple. They are constants in the name, so they will not change. Basically, it is a property that is fixed at compile time. So if I were to come into one of these functions and try to assign our constant max trackable targets, You'll see that has that dot C. If I do that equals whatever, it will throw an error, cannot assign a new value to a constant. So these are fixed at compile time. Uh, these are not something you can change in the editor. You know, the at export statement allows you to modify variables of uh, a constants. They're fixed. And usually there's like a hardware reason for them existing. Uh, you see, I put some colorful commentary about making up my constant because I didn't have a good reason for this one to exist other than a demonstration. Uh, the other thing up here are signals, which are the opposite of methods. So methods are called signals do the calling. These ones that you've probably used before have their connections where you can hook into function here. Uh, so every time the signal is emitted, this function will be called. This is very useful to avoid polling. Uh, if I go back into that laser turret class I was messing around with earlier, you'll see that in this process function, the first thing I'm doing is grabbing that radar.nearest target. And so every single frame we're asking, hey, what's the nearest target? What's the nearest target? What's the nearest target? We don't need to keep asking this question all the time. Uh, it doesn't change that often. And so a better practice is to have a function here on target changed. And when this function is called from the signal, uh, we can go and we can set this nearest enemy down here. So it might make a little more sense to define things this way. And then this function can be called from that signal. Uh, so every time we change the nearest target, we emit this. So those are the signals. Uh, you'll notice they are formatted kind of like a method, and that's because they are going to be calling with this parameter. So for a method, this is the parameter that you pass in when you call it. For a signal, this is the parameter that you get when it is called. So if I'm attaching this, I need to have a track body target as my value that's coming in. Speaking of which, I should probably crack open this class. It's pretty rare to see one class with every kind of documentation, and so I couldn't fit everything into this radar itself either, uh, but I made a track body class. Now, this is a simple wrapper. Uh, so a wrapper is a class that take something that already exists and just puts a little extra functionality around it. Uh, so in my case, I'm simplifying things. I just have a position. I don't have the global position versus local position. Uh, I'm also going to do things like calculate a future position, which is going to be taking a bullet position and a bullet velocity and doing math. And because there's different types of bodies, they have different types of velocity. So all that gets smoothed over and it's hidden. So I put a to do on the code for this get future position function uh, because I was writing the documentation for this video. I didn't really want to stop and have to figure this out right then and there. Uh, so I'm going to come back and fix this, but because this isn't actually returning a future position, it's just giving you the target's position, it would make sense to mark this as not being super useful yet. And so that's where this experimental flag comes in. And you will see this sometimes. More often than not, experimental will show up not on a method itself, but on the entire class. So if I come back up to this documentation and put the experimental flag, by the way, the other flag you may see is deprecated. If I put that on here, uh, you'll now see a very clear warning that'll say this is marked as deprecated and will be removed in future versions. Um, and then going back into the track body, we will see this is marked as experimental. It is likely to change or possible removal. So in the actual editor, there are a number of classes that will show up with these warnings. 
uh, if I hit the control A to add, uh, we'll see some of the navigation agents are marked as experimental. There's a skeleton marked as deprecated. So keep an eye on those warnings. There aren't a lot, but as the engine changes, there may be new classes that show up with these warnings. Uh, here's a few more navigation stuffs being worked on. Uh, if you're watching this video in the future, these may not be marked as experimental. Something else might. But beside all this, you may have noticed the enumerations. Uh, this is a constant type thing. Uh, this is specifically a collection of options or values. There is a little number assigned here. You may see these numbers assigned. And uh, notice when I change this to 100, the ones below it change. So this is not like a key value array. Don't expect to be assigning a number of bullets or number of armor values or whatever. Like the reason for setting the numbers explicitly are usually because you want to preserve numbers. Let's say, for example, something like Minecraft, you might have a block identifier. Let's say you have 256 maximum. I may want to define that I am reserved up to 200, and then modders or other people get 200 onward. So that's something you may see where these numbers are defined, but when it's just implicit, uh, it starts at zero. Uh, and so these are used, uh, you'll see down here, my state is an enumeration, and it tells me I am one of these things. Uh, this is currently being tracked by the radar, it's outside the radar's range, or it's been destroyed. Another thing you may notice here for this track body, I am explicitly defining an init function. This is not something you'll see in nodes because nodes use the ready function, but for other things, you may see an initializer. So my thing just showed up as an init function, but here you can see in like a vector two, you actually get constructors. So these are a function where you can call new vector two and then put in what it comes from. Now, all of these things are actually written in a language other than JDScript. So they do some stuff that you can't actually demonstrate within JDScript. So this is one of them, constructors. Another one coming down is operator overloading. So operators are the multiply, divide, add, subtract, etc. The reason you'd want to overload those, uh, let's say a string, if you add two strings together, what is that actually supposed to do? What does that mean? If you go back to the elementary definition of addition, uh, adding strings together doesn't mean anything. And so the idea that actually addition is concatenation, that needs to be explicitly defined. Uh, so you can see here for vector two, the add adds each component of a vector two. I think the same thing for multiply, it multiplies each component. Uh, because if you remember multiplication with vectors, you get the dot product and the cross product. So if you're using this operator, this is explicitly what it's doing is multiplying each component. Uh, and so that is, it's really useful to check those operators uh, if you're going to be using them on anything that isn't like an integer where elementary mathematics apply. Final thing you may notice for the node, there are a lot of these underscore methods and these actually say virtual. This is another thing I can't demonstrate very well. The weapon class actually has some things like set weapon level and uh, get title, get details. These are for my, my upgrade card system. And so these need to get a string from the child class. And so I just have an error and capital documentation. Uh, so this one will come and redefine this, but that's how a virtual method works is you have a parent that is going to be calling this method or is going to have this method called on it and then the child class actually defines what that is so the everyday examples of those are going to be the ready and the process functions these are defined you know if hold control click on it uh down here as virtual in the node itself uh, but it's going to be used in your overwritten class I think that is it for the documentation today. Uh, there's always more. Let me know if I missed something. Um, let me know if this video was useful. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.